Let's talk about spirituality in everyday life, you know, because we come to these workshops and we go through super intensive practices thinking, well, heaven lies in meditative practice, but when I go back to the office, it's all over and I'm back to hell, you know. Uh, you can always identify the mature, seasoned spiritual student in the way they react to everyday life. The people who have been in it for a long time no longer believe in the idea of duality. Duality means the mosque, the church, the meditation is holy, but the subway in New York City is not. And any mature meditator knows that it's one and the same. The reason it's all the same, by the way, the idea of uh, lack of duality is called Advaita. And it comes from this notion. We have energy and we have solid matter. So sunlight is energy, the tree is solid matter. And we all know, going back to science, that all solid objects come from energy. So there's source energy. Think of it this way. There's vapor that turns into water, and then water in the refrigerator turns into ice. So the original vapor, which is kind of you know, subtle energy, turns into a solid block of ice. All of the world is like that. You have solid objects, you have energy, but the source of all solid objects is energy. Coming back to God, the Lord is a pulsing energy of consciousness underneath or beyond the atom. And everything is made of that one force. So if you study the spirituality or the spiritual texts of all the nations, they all mention one thing, that there is one force, there is one source energy, and that one source energy solidifies itself into solid objects or people. By the time it solidifies, uh, we're fooled into thinking the diversity is real. So I'm looking at all of your faces, and we've got all of these different faces. You're dressed differently, so it kind of fools me into thinking that I'm really dealing with 19 people. But the deeper your meditation gets, the more you realize there's one force. We're, we're all breathing the same air. We all have the same needs in terms of safety, pro procreation, some money, shelter. The deeper your meditation gets, the more you feel like you know everybody. You walk into a train station and everybody feels so familiar to you. It's because you've gotten to know your own soul. When you get to know your own soul, you realize there's only one soul. So as you connect with that one energy, you become very comfortably friendly with everybody, almost as if you see the same force in all individuals. You become very friendly in a relaxed fashion. You just approach people. You know, after deep meditation, you approach strangers and you talk in a very easy fashion. Why are you doing that? It's not mood making. It's because in deep meditation, you join that one energy. Once you feel that energy, you approach anybody in a train station because you see the same energy. Diversity doesn't fool you anymore. If you want to get tired fast, believe diversity. If I take you to a beach, you know, all the different bodies and figures and swimsuits and restaurants, it uh, gets you tired. But if you come back to the one force, you see that you're very relaxed. Once you see the one force active in everything, you'll be done with attachment immediately. In other words, you see somebody extremely attractive and you say, Oh, hello, God. And then there's another one on that corner. You say, Oh, hello, God. Here's a different version of you. In other words, one force in a big party. They look different, but it's the one force. So. If your mind has somehow become familiar with that one force, you can enjoy 
all of the great looking people in the party, but you're not clingy, you're not attached, because at some intuitive level, you see one force. I remember a relative of mine had a, an audience with a king. So then he came back to me, he said, Kambiz, you know, I had a one hour meeting with him, but towards the middle of the meeting, I realized this is just a human being. It's true that he's a king, but he breathes the same air and he has the same needs. So, you know, you can see royalty, which will fool you, but then you come back, like you have all these magazines with pictures of royalty. And then if you have a deep meditation, you say, well, that's just another human being. So you don't get that attached. Spirituality in everyday life. Every meeting that you have with a human being or plant or animal should be a meeting with God. So even if you meet somebody really mean or somebody drunk who's swinging fists at you, you just say, this is another version of God. He just doesn't know his own godliness. It's true, you know. Like Hitler used to be a very sensitive painter until the Austrian University turned him down. If we had talked to the acceptance committee of that university in Austria, we could have prevented World War II maybe, because they broke his heart. So uh, everybody has a godly side, and then everybody sometimes forgets that. When you forget your divinity, you go into ego, me, 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 me. And ego thinks that you're different from the other person. So if you get this idea of non-duality, Advaita, every person you meet is a potential meeting with God. And every person you interact with is a chance for you to work on yourself. If you really want to get this five-day workshop, you come out of this workshop and you say, okay, from here on the whole thing is a game. Every circumstance that I encounter is an opportunity for me to work on myself. Every person I see is a different version of God. One force, one breath, like that. So see if you can change so that everything in everyday life becomes spiritual practice. Every time you breathe in, say, thank God, if I didn't have this breath for four minutes, I would have died by now. So every time you breathe, say grace. Every time you breathe, say natural forces. Life is entering my body. Every morning when you wake up, say, thank God. One more day. In other words, what is life? Life is just a picture album, right? From the age of zero to the age of 90, when you're about to go, what is that? The accumulation of those scenes, it's like a picture album. The one with the greatest number of happy pictures is the winner. In the end, we're all going to leave the body. The question is, who's got the best picture album? You know, the most number of experiences, the most number of loving experiences, the more colorful pictures, and also pictures of you helping others, you know? This is a happy scene right now, because we like each other. So this is a nice picture right now. So what if you had a lot of these pictures? <laughs> then you come out to be the winner. At the end, we're going to leave the body anyways. And we can keep pondering the meaning of life. If you ask yoga, what is the meaning of life? They'll give you one answer. They'll say, the reason the God force came into your body to create you is because God wants to exp experience herself as you. And your only mission in this life is to one day realize that you are light and spirit circulating through this physical body. In other words, get rid of your mistaken identity. If you keep calling yourself Susan, that's a mistaken identity. If before you go, if before your death, you realize that I have been spirit circulating in this physical body, you got it. That's the one and only purpose. According to the Vedas, 
the reason you're born is to merge back with God, the Creator, that is already pulsing in your body. When you get rid of the mistaken identity, you're very happy. Try this tomorrow. Every time you breathe, you say, God's breathing through this body. you find that tomorrow is going to be an excellent day for you. Because if your identity is one of God breathing through this body, you have 500 times the courage, you have no fear, you have faith, you're happy, you go to Montreal and just play. You go to your office, but you're playing. You call your client, you're playing. You're responsible, but it's not that serious because your spirit breathing in the body of a financial assets manager. So the whole game is a lot more light. And of course you're going to succeed because spirit breathing through the body cannot think of anything but abundance. Spirit, spirit is like the trees. Trees don't run out of leaves. Springtime comes, they grow more leaves. Pacific Ocean doesn't run out of water. Think about this one exercise. Spirituality in everyday life. Every meeting, meeting with God. Every tough experience, a chance for you to work on yourself. Don't expect other people to change. That's a cop-out. If you want your wife to change, you change yourself. You know, I have so many students say, Kambis, thank you for calming me down, but I'm calm. I'm living with a monster. Why don't you fix him? I say, no, it doesn't work that way. You, you change yourself and perhaps the monster will change or the monster will leave you. If you become extremely calm, a neurotic person in your home will either calm down or they'll leave you. It's one of those two. This is what's neat about working on yourself. Each one of you that works on herself or himself is going to put a lot of pressure on your mate, on your children, and on the family dog. As you become calm, your kitten picks up on you. So there's pressure on the cat to make spiritual progress. <laughs> because your vibes have changed. So, you know, in my profession, uh, I have to be very careful because as I change one person, the repercussions are impacting the whole family. So then you pray that the rest of the family will somehow come along. This is not a sect. So if your husband sees God during mountain climbing, that's fine with me. As long as he sees some version of nature of God. We don't care just about Kriya Yoga. But if you've got a mate who's an absolute atheist and your heart is opening up like this, it's going to be a tough romance. They have to fall in line with you. Let's also talk about having that spiritual certainty that you are holding God's hand in everyday life. Where does that certainty come from? Let's talk about the difference between opinion, belief, and faith. These are three different words. Opinion is usually somebody else's opinion. You buy a New York Times bestseller, you read it, and you say, wow, what an author. I like it. I agree with him. That's opinion. It's lacking direct experience. It's just that the bestseller really awed you. That's opinion. The next one, uh, then we have belief. Belief means that I'm listening to Kambi's talk and he doesn't seem like a liar to me, so I'm willing to take 30% chance on what he's saying. I'm willing to try some of his stuff up to 30% to see what happens. So belief is one step higher than opinion. Somebody makes sense to you, you have some trust in them, so you're willing to try something. That's belief. What is faith? Faith is undeniable, repetitive, direct experience. As your spiritual guide, you and I need to resume our friendship. You need to watch me live. I'm 62. You need to watch me live. Well, my mom is 98, so if I have her genes, you've got a, quite a long friendship with me. Keep watching me live. 
That way our friendship is going to develop. As our friendship develops, you're going to see an undeniable number of direct experiences. It's like you're going to gauge whether your life is improving or not. You're going to gauge to see if you're becoming more focused and calm or not. You're going to gauge to see whether the advice I'm giving you by mirroring yourself back, you're going to see if the advice you're getting is leading you to good places. This friendship between you and I has to be time proven. I'm willing to take the test. You have to see if you can stick around. Here's the magic sentence. Results never lie. Write this on the back of your closet door. Results never lie. If you're achieving good results with a friendship, hang on to that friendship. The other thing is don't go window shopping. I'm all for it. I read 300 books the first year and a half of my journey. Read as many books as you'd like. But find one path, one teacher that you trust, and follow it to the depths. Fourteen teachers are, are just going to scatter you. So I'm not jealous. I'm just saying dig one well until you get to water. The 14 wells are just going to take longer because you're scattering your energy. In terms of books, I read, phew, you should see my library. You can also go to many, many workshops. I was just as curious as you. Eventually, I realized that all the books are saying the same thing. At some point, you're going to stop reading books. Not now. When you get really, really deep, you're going to stop reading books. Because you read the first paragraph, you say, ah, oh, there it is again. One force circulating in everybody, living in the present moment. Okay, so what will give you undeniable faith? Several repetitive deep experiences, uh, like in meditation. You're meditating and you get sucked into this void. It feels like infinite space and that happens to you five times. I give you energy between the eyebrows Every time I lay my finger on your eyebrow center, uh, you suddenly go empty or your spine becomes hot. And that's a repeated experiment. If it repeats five times, then you would be a fool to deny it because it's happened at least five times. You have a dream of me talking to you in your dream and suddenly you rise and go into prayer on your bed. That's not a normal dream. It's a different kind of dream. What other things give you faith? Uh, you're looking for an answer and suddenly you run across a book that's got all the answers. Or you really pray to God for a good kind of friend. And somebody says hello to you at a bus stop. Almost immediate response. Every time you put your forehead down on the ground and say, God, this time I really don't know with all of my IQ and Harvard and Princeton education, this time I really don't know. Help me out. If you ever put your head down on the floor with that kind of sincerity, you'll never miss. Something is going to show up. Because, you know, God doesn't speak English. So mm, you have to learn God's language. You have to become so mature that you know how God speaks to you. Here's a magic question for you. What's the difference in your inner state between the weeks when all the traffic lights are turning red versus weeks when all the traffic lights are turning green? There's a difference in you between those two types of weeks. Some people say, oh, I know, it's, it's resistance. When I'm defensive and resistant, all the doors shut down. Figure it out. Uh, Already you've recognized that there are some weeks that are pretty smooth. Other weeks, it's so hard to move things. What's the difference in your inner state in between those? Right now I'm talking about how to recognize God's voice. It is done through symbology. God speaks through your dreams, intuition, 
What's your gut feel? Another thing, your body is constantly talking to you. If you're a younger woman and you go out on a date, watch your body as the guy picks you up to go to dinner. Are you breathing deep, slow, easy, as if you're sitting next to a springtime uh, breeze? Or are you excitedly nervous? Your body is, when you go out on a date, your body is constantly talking to you, except you're editing it. If you've had a really bad boyfriend, you take your memory back to that first date. If you remember, you see that your body was saying, no, 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 except you edit. Like some people think that super excitement means a good mate. It doesn't necessarily. Even if you think about sexual relationships, uh, the lifelong ones are like, you know the person's smell and they feel soft to you. It's not like this. You know? Most people don't know what serene, um, intimate sex is. Most people think it's ex excitement. Excitement is usually your body saying, oh my God, this is a gorilla I'm dating. <laughs> Think about how God speaks to you. Intuition, a book that shows up. Your body's talking to you on a date. Uh, serendipitous incidents. Why does a certain thing happen? Think about the way we met each other. <coughs> Actually, uh, there's a wonderful exercise you can do. I love this one. Buy a white piece of paper, like mapping paper with some red yarn and some pins, okay? And then, write down uh, how you and I met, or you and somebody significant in your life, and then make that the first pin, twist a piece of yarn around it, and take it back to the previous incident preceding our meeting. And then put a pin into that one, and then go to one other incident preceding the second incident. After about an hour, you come up with a map of a number of incidents that led up to the central incident. Like, think about the day you met your wife, and then backtrack to the previous 20 incidents. When you do this in life, you'll be awed, because when you look at the overall map, you're going to see some intelligence in it you're going to see that you and I met at a time when you were really looking for something. And then who was it that told you? And who was it that told that other person? Draw the map. It's a very fun game. Find one significant incident in your life and make one of these maps out of it. And twist the yarn and then go to the previous incident. It's a beautiful exercise. When you look, when you finish and look at the overall diagram, you just keep looking at it. It's like, is 